So is, is everybody ready? Three, two, one, go. Good evening, everybody. I'd like to welcome you to this event, our Spotlight on Science, held here at St George's University of London. My name is Philip Butcher. I'm standing in for the usual host, who's Julian Ma, the director of our Institute for Infection and Immunity. So I have the pleasure of being in that role for tonight. So I'm a professor of microbiology. Um, and we welcome you here tonight and thank you for joining us. So the spotlight events that we have are to do with topical issues uh, that the public and, and the science community in general uh, get very enthusiastic about and they're sort of so societal issues that we need to solve. And so the spotlight on science is trying to show you what our clinicians and scientists, or both clinician and scientists, are doing here at St George's to talk about their work and how we address some of these topical issues. But before I introduce the session, there are just a few things that we need to know about. And that's uh, if there is a fire alarm, which there probably won't be, but if there are, then we follow our student ambassadors in the green t-shirts and follow them out. Um, the other thing to mention is that this uh, whole afternoon, evening is being uh, filmed and recorded for posterity. <laughs> so if anybody objects to um, being on camera or anything, they can always go to the back and not be part of the film. Um, so, yeah, so everybody leaves. Okay, yeah. um, so that, the evening is going to be slightly different to how we have done them in the past. And we're going to cover the subject, which is on, on the slides here, which is we're going to cover the topic of um, antibiotic resistant bacteria, but in the context of sexually transmitted infections. And in a minute, I'm going to introduce you to our host who's going to direct and uh, run this evening's event, who's Dr. Tariq Sadiq, who's sitting here. Um, so the other thing to remember, and Julian likes to emphasize this, it's a very relaxed and informal occasion. And so please feel free to um, help yourself to drinks and cakes at the, at the back. Maybe not when the talks are going on and things, but you know, in, when there's a gap or at the end, there'll be plenty of time. And if we do have time for one or two questions during the event, we might have one or two, but there will be plenty of time at the end for questions. So if you've got any questions that you want to ask, try and s save them up for the end. Yeah. Okay, so um, moving on, it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Tariq Sadiq, who's going to lead this evening's session. And Tariq is a, a reader in the, in the university here, a reader in HIV and sexual medicine. He's also a consultant physician in the hospital, and he's also director of our um, Diagnostic Research and Evaluation Unit. And Tariq is going to talk us through the evening. So. Over to Tariq. I've got to give you the microphone. <laughs> so this session is about technology, and we have to share a single microphone. So that's a great start. <laughs> so this is the technological bit here, me just clipping on my microphone. So uh, welcome for me as well to, to the Spotlight and Science evening. Um, as Philip said, I, I work in the Trust, and I also work in the university. I've been a consultant here for about 15 years, but worked in sexual health medicine for about 25 years treating people with sexually transmitted infections and it's really nice to see colleagues in the field here tonight as well. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about a few of the situations that we tend to confront in sexual health clinics and this is particularly the domain of patients coming in with some kind of symptom. I've seen many many patients have come in with for example genital pain or genital discharge. This is very very frequent complaint. And the difficulty for us as sexual health doctors is that different kinds of infections can cause the same kinds of symptoms. And it's very difficult to choose the right treatment for those patients. So if you think about going to a GP and you've got a, a, a chest infection, for example, the doctor might decide to give you some antibiotics. Now, it's easier for them to choose the right antibiotics because only a few antibiotics can cover most of the bugs that they've got that you might have. But actually, for us, it's different. All the different causes of the uh, symptoms that patients might have um, have got to be treated by different antibiotics. And that makes life very, very difficult. Furthermore, we have got to try to treat our patients as quickly as possible. Firstly, if you leave a, some of these sexually transmitted infections untreated for longer, they can cause serious problems. For example, chlamydia can cause problems with infertility and chronic pain in women. And also, if you don't treat them quickly enough, patients can transmit their sexually transmitted infection to somebody else. So it's really important to try to get the diagnosis as quickly as possible. And at the moment, 
in many, many clinics, it takes about five, seven, maybe 10 days to get a sample to a laboratory, whether it's a urine or a swab sample, and for it to come back to the doctor so that they can treat the patient accurately. And by that time, we've usually given the treatment. And that treatment may well be not the perfect or the, the, the correct treatment for that patient, which as you'll hear later on, may actually be quite damaging. Now, that's the scene that we have largely across the country here and in many sexual health settings around the world, but things are beginning to change. There are new types of technologies that will allow us to treat patients much, much more accurately because they provide a result while the patient is waiting in the clinic. And we're gonna start illustrating and showing how this might work. Uh, by a bit of a role play. This is the different thing that we're doing today. So I'm going to introduce uh, a few of my colleagues. They are all research assistants in the uh, ADRU unit that I direct. Um, and I'm actually directing them today <laughs> as actors. So what we've, we have here, uh, I'm not going to say Dr. Claire Broad because she's not a doctor. This is Claire Broad, she's a research assistant and she's actually working to recruit patients for a diagnostic evaluation, actually testing how good some of these tests work in multiple clinics um, around the country. And she's gonna be acting as a doctor. She's not a doctor. <laughs> this is Emma, Emma Grace. She's also working on these rapid test technologies. She's working with, I can see Dr. Fuller in the, at, at the back there, who's working on how well these tests can be implemented into clinical and national health systems. And she's gonna take the, take, take the role of a worried patient with a sexually transmitted infection. She's not a patient with a sexually transmitted <laughs> infection. And over here, we have Laura Phillips. Now, Laura works in my lab. She's a research scientist, and she's become a real expert at running this particular diagnostic and other diagnostics. And she's going to play the role of a real expert who's very good at running these types of diagnostics. So, so she's a real expert. So without further ado, I'm going to pass over to, to the play. Uh, Emma, please. Hiya. Come and take a seat. So what brings you here today? My ex said he had an infection and he just told me to come into clinic, so... Okay, and do you know what that infection was? He said something about chlamydia, but I'm not too sure. Okay, well before we do anything, if I could just get you to take a swab. So here's the swab, and here's some information about how to take it. So it's just a self-collected vaginal swab, okay? There's some screens over there, just take the swab for me. Okay, thank you. Five minutes later. Five minutes. <laughs> 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 Great, thank you. So I'm just going to take this to the lab. I won't be a moment. Hi, Laura. Can you just test this for me? Lovely, yeah. Okay, so while the doctor carries on taking a sexual history from the patient, my name's Laura and I work in the laboratory testing the samples we receive, and I'm going to show you how this piece of technology works. So we start by putting our sample into this cartridge, which is very small, um, and then we feed it into our machine, which is also very small, and we get a diagnosis in just 30 minutes. So if we look at the underside of the cartridge, I'll just wait for that, you can see all these tiny channels, and they effectively condense the laboratory testing process onto this small cartridge. So we just plug it into our machine, and it will run the test on the cartridge, and in 30 minutes we'll have an accurate diagnosis. So to show you how easy it is to use this machine, could I get a volunteer to help me put this sample on? We're going to run it in real time. <laughs> it's not a real patient sample, <laughs> but it is an infected sample. Yes? Hello, what's your name? Anatole. Hi, Anatole. Would you like to put on some gloves for me? Thank you. Lovely. All very professional here. Okay, so as you can see, so we have our diag uh, di diagnostic here. Mm -hmm. so, that, so if you want to have a go, so we just first go on the run cancel test. That's yeah. the right one. Okay, so what it wants us to put in here is our specimen ID, okay? okay so if you could just type in, we're going to just type in um, Emma test for this one because Emma's our patient. Okay. So here we'd normally have a hospital number or something like that. Or you can just do it. Okay. Space. 
Oh, that's fine. <laughs> Anything will do. Okay, an enter for me. Okay, so if you just press next now. Okay, so now it wants us to load the cartridge, which I'm going to do for oh. you so that we don't have to. Okay, so the packaging with the cartridge actually comes with a pipette, which will take up exactly the amount of sample we need. So. So I'll do that bit. Okay, now you can take over. If you want to put the cartridge into the device, just slot it in. It should, yeah, exactly. Does that look fun? Yeah. Okay, so if you just slowly push the drawer back in. Okay. Lovely. So we have our specimen ID, and this is the test we're running. So if you just press run test in the middle. Okay, lovely. So we started running the test. It's going to take half an hour now. Um, you can sit back down, please, Anatole. I'll take your glass from you. Thank you. Lovely. So I'll hand you back over to Claire. Okay, so now we've just got to wait for those results. Oh, wow. Doesn't it usually take a couple of days? Like, will I get treated today, or...? So normally we would give you some antibiotics to cover you for any infections that we think you may have. But we've actually got a new test, and it only takes half an hour, so we could get the result on the day. Oh, wow. What even is this test? So, as I said, it's a new machine... <laughs> that we have in the clinic <laughs> and it does only take half an hour so actually it would be better if we could just wait for the result before we give you any treatment I mean do you know anything about antibiotic resistance? No not really Okay so sometimes when we give you antibiotics they don't always work and we call that antibiotic resistance so when we want to test you for bugs that may be resistant we have to do a load of other tests and they can take quite a long time to get results back and the beauty of this machine is that it also allows us to test for any resistance within those bugs. So actually, it's a really good test if you can wait half an hour. Okay, so will you test my sample for antibiotic resistance today? So let's see whether you have anything first, and then we can judge from there. But actually, as you do have half an hour, you may as well take a seat back in the waiting room. And I can just call you when your result's ready. Okay. Right, well... Antibiotics really have made a big difference to the treatment of STIs over, STI stands for sexually transmitted infections, over the last 60, 70 years. I mean, the real principle about treatment is trying to give something that's really effective and can be given as a single dose because the patients and the people that we tend to treat are very vulnerable and they often tend to be very mobile and you might not see them again. So you want to give a single dose and the antibiotic repertoire, if you like, the total different types of antibiotics that we've had, really did, did fill that purpose. Until more recently, that is, it's the, the pattern is beginning to change. We're not necessarily giving just one antibiotic and that's because of antibiotic resistance. And resistance affects different bacteria, different infections differently. And one of the most important infections that it's affecting, and you'll hear more about this very shortly, is gonorrhea. Gonorrhea used to be treated very simply with penicillin, but it's, it's kind of illustrative that over the last 10 or 15 years, we have had to change the guidance that we've been giving to doctors about how we t treat gonorrhea many, many times. And we're actually left with only one practical option of, of how to treat this infection, and that's an injection called keftriaxone. It's, a, it's an injection that's a bit like penicillin, not quite the same. And if that starts to fail, if we get resistance to that antibiotic, well, then actually we don't really have anything that will definitely work. And we're beginning to see that happen very, very slowly, but it's beginning to happen. So we really are in a lot of trouble. Our options are narrowing down. So one of the things that we can do to try to address this, not the only thing, one thing, for example, is we could try to get new types of antibiotics. But another thing that we can do is to try to make our diagnostic tests, those types of tests, better, not just saying what infection is present, but what um, antibiotic might work for a particular strain once you've diagnosed that, uh, that infection. So I'm actually going to put the um, thing on now. I think it's this, the AV, yeah. AV thing, isn't it? Okay. Is it on? Okay. Yeah. That's the one, yeah. Can I speak here? Okay, so I know that some people can see over there and so I'm going to actually use the mouse here to illustrate uh, the whole principle a bit, a bit more. So this is a schematic, a cartoon diagram of that very complex underside 
of the cartridge that you've just seen. That cartridge is produced by a company called Atlas Genetics, with whom we've been working very, very closely, actually for the past seven years. We've actually got the chairman of Atlas Genetics here, John Clarkson, whom, I, uh, who, whom I've known for a very long time. And, it, and I'll tell you a little bit of a story. Normally, when we start collaborations or research ideas, they often tend to happen in corridors. They don't tend to happen where people deliberately get together. People have a conversation in a corridor in a university. Well, our idea was a, co a conversation in a corridor, but it wasn't a corridor of a university. It was in a corridor of power. It was in the Houses of Parliament. We accidentally, well, we went both to a same meeting and we started talking about that device and some of the work that we'd been doing on antibiotic resistance and came up with this idea of actually creating a test that could be rapid and deliver uh, I, the, um, an antibiotic resistant result at the same time as delivering um, um, the result of a, uh, of a diagnosis. So we've got here Neisseria gonorrhea, which is gonorrhea, NG, and we're also looking for another infection that not many of you may have heard of called Mycoplasma genitalium, which has also got a problem with resistance. Now if you look, so here's the, I hope, is my, is the pointer showing up on yeah. that side? Great. So this is really simplified version of what the kinds of things that are happening on the underside of this cartridge. Once um, Laura and Anatole put that sample into that reader over there, that machine, the sample then goes into a well where the DNA is actually taken out from the sample, it's released. And then that DNA is massively amplified. Loads of copies of that DNA are made and sent to different chambers here. It's almost as if the tracking of the the, the sample through these micro channels, and that's what the, the real advance has been, the micro engineering, um, is like taking a sample from one part of a lab to another to do, another, to do a different reaction. It's all literally lab on a chip. After it goes into this chamber, there's, and, and the sample is amplified, an amplification just simply means that if there's an infection there, the DNA of that infection gets massively copied. It then moves into another chamber where detection happens. And this is made possible by advances in both engineering and molecular biology. It's really quite simple. One of the principal, principles it works on is the fact that as volumes get smaller, reactions get quicker. That's why we can do things so quickly, rather than take hours and hours and hours like it used to in the lab and give you results over days, we can give results in minutes because the smaller the sample, the bigger the relative surface area for the reactions, the much faster the reaction. So I'm really grateful to the uh, National Institutes of Health Research to actually fund our idea we actually applied a few years ago and they gave us one and a half million pounds to produce this device. So it was, uh, it was really great, it's been a great project and we're coming to the end of actually evaluating its accuracy. So it's not only this, this type of device that we're working with, we're actually working with other types of technology. Now I've got something in my pocket which just shows you the scale of how these devices are changing. So this kind of thing, which looks like a, either as a mobile phone charger or a kind of a, an elaborate USB stick, is basically something called the nanopore or a minion. And this has been developed by a company called Oxford Nanopore Technology over a few years ago. And the, the new versions of it are more and more accurate. It's basically a gene sequencer. Now in this, the earlier version of the, the, the version of the cartridge that I just showed you, what we look for is for DNA. The DNA of the infections that are important that we want to find, but also the DNA that encodes for resistance. We look for small segments of DNA and we try to detect them in that cartridge. This is different. This doesn't look for small segments of DNA. This actually looks at long segments of DNA and then reads that DNA. And I've got a cartoon diagram here to show how that works. So imagine, if you just imagine then this thing that we ha I'm holding in my hand, so it's a handheld technology that's plugged into a, uh, a laptop. Inside here, there's what we call a flow cell. In that flow cell is this membrane. It's a very thin membrane. And in that membrane, there are thousands and thousands of tiny, tiny pores. Those pores are perhaps 100,000th of the width of a human hair, perhaps even smaller than that. And along with those pores are these funny looking machines. They're actually biological machines 
that are molecular motors. They grab DNA. DNA is a long molecule with lots of letters for the codes. It grabs the molecule and threads it through those pores. And as each letter goes through the pore, it's actually detected as that particular letter. And it's then sent as part of the growing sequence that we read. And that sequence can tell us about the, the identity of the pathogen or the infection and the presence or absence of antibiotic resistance. It's really quite remarkable. And its portability means it can go places. It's very simple to process the, the chemistry, if you like. So this has actually been on the International Space Station. Um, it's been beside volcanoes. It's been on Great Lakes. Um, it's discovered, it's been used to discover new species. We've actually adapted the technology in our group here to be able to use it in vulnerable populations in Latin America. So we're actually going out to South America and some of the people who are doing that are in this room um, to, to see if we can use it for vulnerable populations like female sex workers in remote areas. And this is work that's ongoing, ongoing now. Um, so I'm now going to introduce Dr. Gwenda Hughes. Um, it's all great to talk about fancy technology, uh, but the technology means nothing if we don't know how these infections are being spread, and particularly with regard to antibiotic resistance, how we can best monitor it, and how we can best use these tests to intervene. To understand that, we have to understand why antibiotic resistance is such a threat. Dr. Gwenda Hughes is the head of the, the STI service at Public Health England. Now, you may have seen in the past few days that there have been uh, BBC headlines and other headlines about the rise of syphilis and gonorrhea in England and Wales. And those were reporting on reports that were authored by Dr. Hughes. So, Gwenda, so over to you. Oh, yeah, so sorry, <laughs> the, the technological bit. Yeah. Get it to work. Is there a doctor in there? <laughs> <laughs> Steady on. <laughs> there we go. Thank you. But this is the microphone for the room. Okay. You move it forwards and backwards. Is that okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Tarek. So what I was just going to have a little bit of a um, chat about was really why, what's the kind of public health importance of uh, antibiotic resistance, what we know about it, and how we monitor it, um, particularly in this country. So this is just the sort of key facts about antibiotic resistance as, as the view from the World Health Organization. And they see it as one of the biggest threats to global health. Um, food security and development today. They say that antibiotic resistance can affect anyone of any age in any country. And also, crucially, that antibiotic resistance occurs naturally, but misuse of antibiotics in humans and animals is accelerating the process. So, for example, if you're, um, we were talking earlier about going to your GP with a chest infection, um, people wanting to get antibiotics for that, but of course, the majority of these are viral infections and antibiotics are not going to do you any good at all in that situation. Okay, and there's also um, a growing number of infections, um, all in, not just in sexual health, but um, pneumonia, tuberculosis, gonorrhea is obviously an important one, and uh, salmonella. They're becoming harder to treat um, as these antibiotics become less effective. Um, and obviously we're concerned about it because it can lead to longer hospital stays, higher medical costs, and in some cases increased mortality. Okay, so this little diagram is really just to sort of give you an idea of how things have changed over time then and now. So on the top, it's just showing you, just to, it's just a, a diagrammatic thing really to show you that in the past we had quite a lot of antibiotics to use available to us and there was some resistance developing and there's a sort of feedback loop there where the more antibiotics you use then the more resistance develops to the situation we're in now where what you see is that we have a lot and a lot and a lot of resistance has emerged, but the, the, the amount of antibiotics we have to, to use to, to treat the, the various infections is diminishing. And um, 
if not tackled, it's, it's thought that um, this could have a really devastating impact. And it's be, it has been estimated that by 2050, the death toll, this is for all AMR, not just sexual health, um, could be one person every three seconds if it's not um, tackled now. Okay, so what about sexual health? Now, as Tarek mentioned, there are a few fit infections we're concerned about with respect to antibiotic resistance, but the key one we're worried about at the moment is gonorrhea. And it is, in fact, among uh, nine of the bacteria that the WHO, the World Health Organization, have said is of international concern, and it has been classified as an urgent public health threat. And this is just to illustrate, it's a bit like that earlier diagram I showed you in a different way. What we have here, this is going back to the 1930s on the top left, going down to the present day uh, uh, at the bottom right. And what you can see uh, in the years on the bottom there are the, the, the treatments we were using for gonorrhea over time. So you can see in the 1940s penicillin, then we were starting to use tetracyclines, ciprofloxacin, azithromycin and so on. And then what you can see here on the top of this bar is how um, when resistance was first documented in gonorrhea um, to those antibiotics. Um, so you can see that um, it, it doesn't take very long in each case where when you, um, you introduce uh, ciprofloxacin that you start to see ciprofloxacin resistance emerging here in 1991 and so on. And, and you can see also over time that over this period, um, that's a lot of different classes or types of antibiotics that have developed resistance to gonorrhea. So we're looking now, or are we thinking now about we're in the territory of, of superbugs. Um, so what we do, so I work at Public Health England and what we do, um, a key thing that we do is, is surveillance of resistance because as Tarek mentioned, unless we know how much resistance there is and how fast it is spreading, then it's very difficult to know what, um, how, what antibiotics to use when you're treating. And often we treat empirically. I mean, Tarek's just demonstrated a great way of finding a, a point of care if the, if the patient's going to have a, a resistant uh, bug. And that, that is fantastic if you can do that. That's often not the case though. And you need to just treat someone with the drugs that you think might are most likely to work. And so in order to do that, you need to know how common resistance is. So this is just looking at a graph and this is just trends of antibiotic resistance in England and Wales to gonorrhea. Um, so, um, in gonorrhea, sorry. So up on the, the, that, the, shall I just do it with this actually? That'd be easier. <laughs> so if you look on the, on the y-axis here, this is the percentage of all the, the bugs that we have tested that were resistant to that particular antibiotic. And on the bottom here, we have the year that we did the testing. And um, so, so essentially what we're seeing is how common was antibiotic res resistance to the bugs that we tested in each given year. And we started in 2000, uh, this goes up to 2016, but we've, and we've got just recently published data for 2017. And what you can see is that, um, so this green bar here, this is um, ciprofloxacin, and the red one here, this is penicillin. Now this 5%, we generally consider that when resistance gets above 5%, it's, it's a little bit becoming a bit less useful just for um, empiric treatment. Um, and what we did then, um, so up until this point in 2005, we were in fact using ciprofloxacin as the, that was the main treatment we were using for gonorrhea. But when we were looking at our data, we could see actually resistance was rising very pretty rapidly after um, following its introduction. So in 2005, a decision was agreed with lots of professionals to change the treatment. And we changed it to this one here, this the blue one, this is called cafixine. This is this blue one here. And so we, in 2009, actually, we it's quite good because we moved a lot more quickly in the, the, the second time that this happened, because you can see we were quite late to change the therapy the first time round. But we saw this rise occurring here in about 2010. And so the antibiotics were changed again, as Tariq mentioned. So that now we're using, we're actually using dual therapy now. That's keftriaxone, which is the injectable drug. But also we use that alongside another drug called azithromycin. But, so this is just looking at the trends generally. But more recently, what we've been seeing are some other 
kind of more worrying developments, and this is the kind of more rapid spread of more highly resistant strains of bugs to gonorrhea. And we recently re um, saw um, and, ha and are still in fact dealing with an outbreak of very, very highly resistant gonorrhea to one of the drugs that we use to treat it currently, um, azithromycin. And this got quite a lot of media attention. You may remember it was, it was called super gonorrhea and it started as an outbreak in Leeds. Um, it got quite a lot of press attention at the time. And I'm just going to show you now a little graph of what happened with super gonorrhea, so, as they were calling it. Um, so you can see, um, so along here we have the year and month. So it was first um, seen at the end of 2014, early 2015. Up here we just have the number of cases. So these are just individual cases. And these colours represent the part of the country where we started to see cases. So we'd emerged here, this red, this is in the Leeds area. But you can see within a year it started to spread to other parts of the country. And if you look, you just follow along to 2017, these lovely dark green coloured boxes here these are London and we now see almost about half of our cases are now in London um, and, it, and it, what's also interesting about this is that it started as an outbreak in heterosexual populations and then it moved quite quickly into MSM and now it's just spread rapidly around the country and in uh, different risk groups and then more worryingly, um, I don't know if any of you um, were aware of this, but in earlier this year, um, we also confirmed a case that, um, w which I think in this case was really probably appropriately termed super gonorrhea. Because in this case, um, the infection was highly resistant to azithromycin. It was also resistant to keftriaxone. So that's our two drugs. That's our last line of defence, if you like, for the treatment of gonorrhea. And it was also resistant to just about other, every other antibiotic we tested it for. So um, it was, and it was, it was dubbed at the time as the, man, as the world's worst gonorrhea. Um, so... We did, in fact, eventually successfully treat this case. It was, it was quite complicated and prolonged to work out what would work. It was successful in the end, but clearly very alarming situation that we were in. And also what was very interesting, it was just after we reported this case in Australia, they identified two cases at around the same time, which were almost identical. So... Uh, so basically we know that we now have these infections now being sp that are starting to emerge that are, are to resistant to, well, just about every drug we have. So this is um, very concerning and I think just to highlight how important it is um, it, that we, we think about how we use antibiotics appropriately. But of course, the other thing, of course, I would say this because I work in public health and it's my duty is to say that what the other thing that's really important is prevention. So testing people and treating them appropriately, pr appropriately that's great, but we also need to prevent infections. And um, so one of the things we think is also really important is to highlight the importance of clearly of condom use to try and uh, reduce infections as well. So in addition to good testing practice, good treatment, you also need to start to think about how you can reduce uh, infections as well. And that was all I was going to say. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, so I think that's right. So I, I think, no, don't, don't sit down, don't sit down, because I'm going to borrow some chairs, actually. Let me get this chair. I'd like you to sit down here. Yeah. Okay, can I get my You need to speak into myself, the microphone. Oh, do we? Because if you look at that TV screen, there's still nine minutes to go before Emma has to find out her news. So we're going to use that time um, to build questions. So if any of you got any questions for myself or for any of the team, for Gwenda, uh, please, please do. Uh, something about this reminds me of the thing called capture. That's all those little odd characters you find on websites that let you sort of prove that you're a human and not a machine. Um, is there any thought to reusing, uh, using condoms to, in, to uh, educate the machine over there about new strains before they become new strains? If you see what I'm saying. Um, yeah. not, I, I think you're way ahead of me. Right. Here. So, um, <laughs> and me. Um, 
Um, Let's elaborate a bit more. Right, like, uh, okay. Obviously, I haven't thought okay, about okay. it. Okay, capture is a bit of a strange thing. Basically, an odd photo that a machine can't understand, um, that a human can easily identify, is what we use for security of computing nowadays. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering whether, and what that does is kind of uh, separate the, uh, the, the obviously uh, the sort of trivial cases from the difficult problems. It seems to me that condoms are used by people full stop, and they possibly come into contact with the very latest uh, breeds of uh, gonorrhea or STI, and so uh, almost introducing that back into the loop so that that machine over there or uh, whoever it is that's studying the various STIs can get a, uh, a very early feedback to potential changes. So I, 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 I think I, this is a turret. Yeah. I, I, I think it's quite it's an interesting, I, so essentially smart conduct. Yeah. Um, or po possibly, or just um, yeah, feed, basically feeding so the latest the information back. So I think potentially the technology could be developed, I mean I'm not talking about this yeah, system, yeah, yeah. but just in general, to provide that on a surveillance basis. But I think one of the biggest challenges is that the risk of STIs in the population that is using compound is low relative to those that are not. So you've got this sort of uh, uh, issue that, in terms of STIs, you particularly want to get the message yeah. to those who are not using it. But not to say that hmm. some technology could be developed because, yeah. in the sense, the condom's in the right place at the right time. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. But it is interesting what you say, because it might not just be condoms. So you could try to start thinking about sampling. I mean, this is. People have tried to do this, actually. They've actually sampled sewage, for example, mm. for looking at infections of the gut. Um, some people have actually argued that if you sample the sewage coming out of nightclubs on a Friday evening, <laughs> well, you're likely to get that kind of signal that might be important in terms they, of passports. They, they use that, um, don't they use urinals like, to, to look at drugs, what drugs people are using? So they, they, that's used quite a lot. So to see what the range of drugs people are using when they're going clubbing and stuff like that. I mean, you'd have, so to, be, is, you'd have to have a test that's really sensitive because there's, along with infected urine, there's going to be lots of uninfected <laughs> urine and going to die. So whether it's practical or not, but people have actually argued to do this kind of thing. So it, maybe as the technology gets better, like we might be able to do similar kind of things. People do work with discarded condoms. For example, actually the work, we've got Abby here, over there, who's going to be doing, she's going to be working with discarded condoms, looking at Zika virus um, and uh, among sex workers. So these are really interesting. So but you can look at places where you wouldn't normally look to get your sample, um, uh, as long as you consult an ethics committee. I think. <laughs> <laughs> you talk about your, the handheld little machine. I do a lot of work, aid work abroad in countries where you know you've got you know, so in Kenya where you've got prostitutes. With, you know, I mean, what is going? I mean, obviously the cost at the moment, but. A lot of the antibiotic resistance will come from there because antibiotics are even more misused. I mean, we've misused them, but they're hugely misused before everybody gets it and often because they've got infections that need to be treated. So it's sort of thought, I mean, we do malaria tests. Well, we did have a quick malaria test, but then it's slightly faded because it was expensive. Mm. So is there thoughts, I mean, with them to try and to start in countries abroad almost? I mean, we need to do something here, but... Yeah, no, I think, I mean, so, so a large part of our work is actually done abroad. Um, and I think some of the applications, particularly for the sequencing, may well be abroad in low and middle income countries. Um, but you hit the nail on the head with regard to cost. So cost is important. So um, these diagnostics cost a lot of money. Um, and they're only going to be effectively used and deployed in uh, low and middle income countries if the cost comes down to about five to ten dollars. But anything higher than that, it's just going to be unaffordable. I would argue that ten dollars is too much. Five dollars is probably where you need to be. Sorry, five dollars. Philip saying, speak up. Sorry. Okay, sorry. Five five dollars is probably <laughs> the limit uh, as to how expensive a test can be. Um, 
So, and that's a real challenge for developers. Now, I think what will happen is that even though the price or the cost of these diagnostic tests at the moment is high, it's way above high um, cost. As you scale up, and as you then the, then the cost will come down, and it depends on how um, successful an individual diagnostic is. I know, for example, um, I mean that's with, with conversations I have with John. That's certainly the case for this diagnostic test. The cost will come down as it's scaled up, and I know the, the producers of the, uh, the Minai are going to be looking towards creating a disposable flow cell, which is actually going to cost between five and ten dollars. I still think, though, even if it starts hitting ten dollars, it's going to be unaffordable. And people, are, cost is going to be the main driving factor. It doesn't matter how accurate it is. It doesn't matter how theoretically you can argue that something, even though it might be less accurate. Um, mm -hmm. uh, is, is really accurate and costs a little bit more, it's going to make a difference. If it can't be afforded by a health system, it probably won't be implemented. In countries where in countries. Would be even, even more important. Yeah, the whole lot. yeah so I don't know much, I wouldn't to elaborate on We've got one minute. So, one of the big things, can I just say a little bit about the worldwide, <laughs> just stepping on Gwenda's area of expertise a little bit. We're looking at a drug called ciprofloxacin, for example. And that drug, the gonorrhea in this country, there's about 30% resistance, right? That still means 70% of people have a, a strain in which we could use it. And that's where this, anti this diagnostic really can come into play. We can identify the people whom we can use that simple antibiotic instead of the injection. If you go to China, right, ciprofloxacin resistance isn't 30%. It's 100%, right? So there's a challenge, right? You've got to kind of try to tailor make a diagnostics to the changing epidemiology. And that's a big problem. That's a big challenge for us to, to get over, how to quickly change these diagnostic targets. Now, 57 seconds, so a quick, a quick question. <laughs> so, Melanie, so. Well, we're really hopeful. So we're doing, the, I think they're doing the big evaluation now in, in the States. We've published some work on sensitivities up right there with the laboratory tests. I think with the specificity, we're really hoping that the specificity of the joint dual test for gonorrhea and chlamydia is going to be right up there. So the idea is that it's going to be the same. You know, there's going to be very little difference between the two. I think if it was vastly different, that would be another reason, certainly in this country, why clinicians will probably say, well, we'll want to go something that's going to be um, as, as accurate as our normal laboratory tests. Something is happening. <laughs> what does it say? Test complete? Press yes. the button for view results. <laughs> oh, so it's, it's over. So, Lara, I'm going to hand over to you now. So, back okay. over to you. So, our test is finished. Um, and if I reveal the result here... Okay, so we're looking here and we can see that it says NG detected, CT not detected. So that tells us that NG, which is gonorrhea, is present in this sample and CT, which is chlamydia, is not present in our sample. So we have a gonorrhea positive here and in the near future this test will also tell us, as been explained, um, what antibiotic we can use to treat this particular strain of gonorrhea and if there's any antibiotic resistance. So I'm going to go and take the result to the doctor. <laughs> Hello, Doctor. Hello. Hello. So the result was gonorrhea positive for that sample, and it also indicated we could treat this patient with ciprofloxacin because they're sensitive to that. Okay? Thank you. Uh, Emma, do you want to come back in? Hi. So your results came back, and your test was actually positive for gonorrhea. So I'm just going to give you some treatment for that now, okay? Is that the injection? Because I've heard that's quite painful. Actually, we can treat you with these antibiotics, which is just tablets. You only have to take them here with some water. And your test showed that actually your strain of gonorrhea can be treatable with these antibiotics. So we don't have to use the injection this time. Okay, so do the tablets work as well as the injection? Yep, yeah, yeah. so they're just a different type of antibiotic, but they'll still work as effectively. And the test is very accurate, so we're confident with the result. Okay, so do I need to come back? or? Um, yeah, you'll need to come back in about two weeks to, for a test of cure to make sure that it's all gone. Um, you must refrain from having any sex for the next week and you'll need to contact your recent partners and get them to come in to be tested and treated as well. Okay, okay? if that's everything, you're free to go. Okay, thank you.
<laughs> okay, so that's the end of the role, role play. So I think uh, a round of applause. <laughs> Philip and uh, my, uh, myself and all the organisers would like to thank all the actors and also Martina for directing as well. So Martina is our programme director in our Drew and she did a lot of the directing. I'm going to um, finish off this phase of the, for the evening and just perhaps to recap what we've done so far, what we've thought about so far with the tests that we've been talking about and then indeed the role play. What did we see? We saw uh, a concerned uh, woman who thought she might have been exposed to a sexually transmitted infection. She actually thought she had chlamydia. She wasn't sure, but she brought that information to the doctor, to the sexual health clinic. And it's true to say that if somebody came with that information to me or to any other sexual health doctor, they are probably going to treat that patient and they probably would have directed that treatment towards chlamydia. But we were able to firstly do a test and in 30 minutes, we were able to confidently say that she did not have chlamydia. You just saw that result. She actually had gonorrhea. The treatment immediately switches. But the new um, form of the diagnostic test in which we can actually look for the DNA um, code that, in, that tells us whether it's resistant to ciprofloxacin, that antibiotic, or not, tells us that we can actually use that drug and not give her the injection we can make the treatment even more precise. And that's going to be really important, not just for her to be confidently treating her in this new era of antibiotic resistance, but also to help prevent the spread of antibiotic resistance. So those are really two important points about why these technologies can make a difference. Now, there is a future. It's not just gonorrhea and chlamydia. I did say something about these other bugs, mycoplasma genitalia, trichomonas vaginalis. These are other causes of these kinds of symptoms. Um, and indeed, the new diagnostics that are coming out are going to put those types of added pathogens onto a single cartridge. That's the aim. And still to try to deliver those results, and hopefully with antibiotic resistance, within half an hour. And um, I mean, we are talking about future medicine. This is the type of thing that's going to happen in the future. This runs off of that at the moment. Literally, plug it in. Oh, forgot about this. Uh, off a laptop, actually very soon it'll be running off a mobile phone. So even more portable. So if we can get that technology right, if we can get that technology to work on all the different bugs, we can really transform the way we treat sexually transmitted infections and at the same time combat antibiotic resistance. So I'm actually going to stop talking now. I mean, I think... Good. OK. Um, I'd just like to thank everybody for their questions and particularly to thank um, Dr. Sadiq and his fantastic acting team. So I wonder who to give the Oscar to. Um, whether to give it to the people that were pretending to be doctors and patients or whether to give it to the scientist who really is a scientist. So my, my voice is to give the Oscar to Lara. I don't know. <laughs> Um, okay, so if anybody wants any further information, we've got uh, these uh, web pages up here, maybe for you, madam, we might find some information. Um, and also, uh, Julian's asked me if uh, there's feedback forms on the ground underneath your chairs, if you would be very kind to fill in the feedback and tell us what you think, um, and maybe even about tonight, and tell us whether you would like some other topics in the future that we can perhaps do for you in the future.